Welcome back and time now for Stargast and in studio we have Liz Lundro and in her own words she describes herself as one person who is hopelessly in love with fashion and the fashion industry and just if you didn't know her well she used she's a model actually and she's also an intellectual property lawyer as well as entertainment lawyer. So remember we told you if you have any questions pertaining to this area, kindly do share that with us. She'll be certain to be answering all of that. Welcome. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. All right, so let's just get right into it. The entertainment industry in the country, we could say, has relatively grown. Yes. And of course, there's so many areas that people remain ignorant to, and it so appears like it's on, on matters, you know, legal matters. How, how is this so? Uh, you know, for the longest time, our industry has sort of flourished in an informal manner. People do not have lawyers, people do, have, do not have managers, so they tended to do a lot by themselves. And now when the African market has sort of opened up, and people realize, oh my goodness, there's an area called intellectual property law that I didn't know about. There's copyright, there's trademarks, there's industrial designs. What is that? Um, so now people have come to realize that they need to use it. Music was the first to start realizing in itself because we all love music. Music makes us happy. Uh, so people now realize there's copyright in music. That's how you protect your music. And then related rights for the performers and the producers and the singers and the dancers, the guys who make the beats. All those guys now have rights, and they didn't know that before. Um, so now, you know, starting with music, they are way, the way they would protect their music would be through copyright. So the person who writes the music, the lyrics, um, the person who helps in the arranging of the melody and tells you, oh, sing here, sing there, rap here, that person also has copyright. Um, and then the person who also comes up with the melody from scratch, that is also a composer. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, so then, you know, people just figuring out those rights, they've not yet for the longest time, even today, they still s struggle with that. Mm -hmm. So you find people are asking for rights where they don't have the rights, or when they ask for their rights, they don't know what right they're asking for. They're so asking it's still for. coming up, yeah. All right, illustrate for us here. Assuming I'm an artist, you know, I feel I'm really talented, I've gotten into maybe a production house and the like. Mm -hmm. What exactly should I be looking for? You know, how should I secure my work? Okay. Uh -huh. So you walk into a studio and let's say, for example, you're going to walk into Decimal, Decimal Media by Musiox. So you need to first have a, an agreement and say, okay, Ms. Yokes, I'm paying you X amount of shillings. What is it for? Is it for studio time or is it to own, for, to own my master recording? You need to have that arrangement from the beginning and have it in writing so that you know the much of, of money you've paid for, what you have really paid for. Most of the time, 10,000 shillings is not enough for the rights in the master recording to pass. So it's mostly studio time. And then when you go into the studio now, um, you need to have what is called a music split sheet. So that's equivalent to a title deed that says you wrote the song, or whatever other roles that you played, you are the performer. You know, if there was a guitarist, they also need to be on that list. If there was someone else who wrote the lyrics for you, they should be there, you know. So that document would cover now everyone's role in the song. And when that is present, then you can have um, opportunities to commercialize that music would be easier. Say, for, an, for example, an advertisement opportunity comes in place. When you produce a music split sheet, you will make some money. When there's no split sheet, the advertising company doesn't know who to deal with. All right. right? So generally you're saying even the production of music, it's like everybody who helped come up with a song. I mean, the guitarist, you know, all those other people participating in, in the song. Yes. Have some sort of uh, share? Yes, they do. So especially for the performers, they have what we call an equitable right, equitable enumeration right. So once they have that split sheet, they will take that to what we call the collective management organizations, the CMOs. So for the performers, they would go to PRISC, Performers Rights Society of Kenya, and say, hi, I was a guitarist, I was a lyricist, please, uh, you know, I mean, I, I was uh, the singer, please uh, register me. And then in turn, the person who was who composed the song would take that to Mpake, the Music Publishers Association of Kenya, All and right. say, hi, I wrote the song. Uh, please uh, register this so that when you're collecting royalties, when you hear this song, you know, I'm the one on the song. And then the producer would do the same. So for example, now we, in the situation I gave, Decimal Media, now Musiox will be the producer, and then he has his contract and will go to the Kenya Association of Music Producers and say, I was a producer in this song. When you collect the royalties, my share will come to me. All right. Yeah. So Liz, generally what you're telling us is for all the creatives, creatives here to mean everybody who has intellectual, you know, content, yes. has a body that somehow protects them 
and a body that takes care of you know yes. all that. So CMOs generally collect royalties on their behalf. So for example, KBC has different programs that use music, but it would be impossible for every artist to come to KBC and say, you played my song, you need to pay me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you pay royalties. KBC will pay royalties to Camp, Pris, Kumpake, and then they will have on their matrix how to distribute now this song, this, this money to the producers, to the performers, and to the music authors and composers. Okay. Yeah, so we have this uh, sort of uh, misconception that sound engineers own intellectual property. No, they do not. They're under what we call a work for hire agreement. You've just come to apply a skill, make the song sound great, you know, do what Sound it is. engineers, literally yeah. to mean the guys who created the beats. No, no, no. Sound so engineers are just mm -hmm. the guys who, they have an ear for sound and mm -hmm. they want to make it sound good or whatever. Mm -hmm. Those are the guys now who are not really having intellectual property. But the producer, the person who finances right. the, the recording, then has the, the, the producer, right? That's the producer in, in our context. If, if Now, for example, in that situation, you only pay 10,000 to Musiox to record you. So, of course, there's this, all these other uh, expenses he, he's incurred. He's going to pay the sound engineer. He's going to pay the electricity. Uh -huh. he, you know, he probably also himself, he has a master's in sound, sound engineering, so he'll also be up for probably four days trying to beat <laughs> a deadline <laughs> for all your right. song to release. So because he's incurred that financial burden, then he's a producer. However, if an artist wants to own it, then they can buy it and say, how much would it cost for me to own the master recording? Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, so, uh, the situation in the country right now in terms of copyright and the artist getting access of all these things, do you think it's easily accessible? Yes, I think it is. For the longest time since Kyakobo, Kenya Copyright Board was um, created under the Copyright Act, they've been very active in, you know, getting the public to know more about the rights and same with the CMOs they have so many you know events we just celebrated the World Intellectual Property Day yesterday yesterday there was amazing functions all over um, the country um, so we have such events going on we have most of them are pro bono actually you don't pay to enter and they come and they hear same thing for you know film people people in film people in you know arts drawing and whatnot they also have something for them there's there's always something happening so what is holding back the artist from claiming the copyright rights and intellectual property and the like what is really happening then I think most of them have sort of what we call acquiesce they've relaxed and say no oh they stole my work it's okay I'll create something else but they don't realize that they are creating then a bad culture because you will earn from this and copyright like for example in copyright you have the right for full your, your lifetime for, I mean for the time you've been alive and then 50 years after death mm -hmm. so imagine you, when you just decide <laughs> ah whatever <laughs> you know it's it's to the detriment so most of them will be like oh I can't afford a lawyer oh it's too much heartache and drama I'm not about that life you just spoke about you know affording <laughs> a lawyer and you're one I mean how much am I looking at as maybe say an artist to hire you as a lawyer you see it depends with also uh, where you are with your craft what exactly you need uh, me to do for you so there's contract drafting it will depend uh, and I always tell people you have to ask to receive you mm -hmm. know don't assume that I know you don't have the money or you know so I will tell you my fee so negotiations yeah negotiations for sure and especially in our industry we are really trying to get artists to to use more lawyers so that they can formalize the industry so that okay. they also do not end up in trouble you know the problem with intellectual property the minute you make a mistake half the time your case is gone it's as good as gone it's very hard to recover we have this saying that bill gates love you know put on online and mm -hmm. published intellectual property has a shelf life of a banana so today your idea is hot tomorrow it's not yeah so when to, while it's hot you need to protect it you need to you know milk it for all it's worth all right the minute you you, you fail then it's tomorrow done. somebody else will be like oh he did that mm -hmm, i'll do that and they <laughs> copy cut and <laughs> all right with it. still on that topic of course you also mentioned it in terms of uh theft of intellectual property here to mean music or whatever other ideas that you have um we have seen and especially currently, there's so many social media users. Maybe I start up a blog mm -hmm. and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm using somebody's idea or maybe say I use the music from maybe say an artist from the country or even say do a cover, mm -hmm. you know, a limba ivi, but I think in a sound poor and limba ivi. Is that theft? What are the yes, consequences? So let me put it like this. I come to your house and you're not home and I check in and I stay in. You'll call the cops, right? Because I'm in your property. So it's the same thing with, with the intellectual property. It's proprietary rights. You cannot use anything that belongs to me without my permission. The Copyright Act is very clear. I have the right when I create something. It is my, it is my right 
to decide how you will use it, when you will use it, the way you will use it. So if you want to do cover songs, you must get a right, uh, you know, a license from the author. Yeah. Um, you know, if you want to use it on your social media platforms, you have to get. Wait, 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 wait. Hold up. Right mm -hmm. there. Social media, especially because it is not very rampant. So assuming I've just decided to put up something, maybe say on Instagram or mm -hmm. even on Facebook. So we are right here or we're having a party and I have uh, maybe music playing and maybe I'm, 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 I'm giving a demo. If this music is playing in the background, have you stolen the music? Yes, because you see you've already interfered with the reproduction, right? It's not yours to take from the beginning, then you've done that. Uh, our artists are yet to really understand that, but when you look at international artists, they've really actualized that. For example, there was a time um, a young boy used um, one of Asha's songs on a YouTube with the mom, and it was so cute. Mm -hmm. But Asha got it taken down because he was like, that's my song. You need to have talked to me first before you put it online. So it was, it's, it's supposed to be, the, it's the same ethos. If it's a blog, I'm going to use a picture. Talk to the photographer first, then agree and say, oh, I'm a blogger, I don't have money, but this is how I want to use your picture. Can we work together? Have it in right. Tell me something here. Now, if maybe say you uploaded the music and you do what most people do, uh, maybe music courtesy of, uh, photography courtesy of, does, is that enough? It's not enough. Just Concept. giving credit is not enough. You've already interfered with the reproduction right again. So you have to talk to the author or the owner and say, oh, um, can I use your work? If yes, then you know, have something in writing, even an email, and you're okay to, to proceed. All right, and of course, now maybe just uh, trying to bring this matter closer to home. We've seen the local artists so many times mm -hmm. do lines, so to speak, or lyrics from uh, maybe international artists. Uh, what exactly would be the legal consequence to such an artist? So as long as I hear a lyric and I can identify that this song is from Marvin Gaye or I don't know, whichever artist, then I need to clear the rights, yeah? So as long as there's that identification and I can tell that it's not yours, then it's very important that you clear with the, with the owners of the song. You'd go either um, your people or the artist people go through the publishers. So like the American system, they have what we call publishers, music publishers. They handle their music business. So then they tend to be part of the copyright holder. So I would call maybe Universal Music Publishing and say, you know what, we want to use this song. What do you need from us? Blah, blah, blah. And then they will give you a contract. Right. Yeah. So it's very important that they do that. Okay. Uh, we've, I guess we've been lucky that no one has been sued yet. But I do know for a fact that Saudi Soul clears their songs. I, I know their lawyer, and they've been clearing their songs. So, and they've been trying to get also other artists to realize that to do the same to thing. To do the same, because right. you know, tomorrow if Asha comes after you, can you afford <laughs> Asha's <laughs> net worth? You that, know? that kind of uh, <laughs> financial consequence and the like. Yes. But now let, let's then oh, get to the Kenya Film Classification Board. What, how, what do you feel about their role in creating awareness to artists and even growing the creative industry in the country? Well, KFCB has been very controversial. Um, and we've actually had a tweet, Twitter conversation today, and uh, I was just telling people that it's called the Kenya Classification Board, Kenya Film Classification. Before it used to be the censorship board, mm -hmm. then the act was changed, it was amended, and now their mandate has changed. So by virtue of them just going around to ban films, that is not, that's not within their mandate. In, in law, we call it ultraviolet. They're working outside their mandate. They're exercising power that they do not have. And it's, ab it's about time this artist now took it to court and applied for what we call a judicial review so that the high court or the court of appeal, they can actually now say, you know what, KFCB, shame on you. That's what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be classifying mm -hmm. so that artists also know, oh, my video looks like this. I only pl have it played at nine o'clock. The broadcasters also know, oh, Saudi Soul released a new song I don't know, Octopizo released a new song, the, the video looks like this, it can only be played on our music shows after nine o'clock because of X, Y, and Z. But to ban it, it definitely sends a wrong message to our artists. So they do not even commercialize back home, they will go to Europe or wherever, and that's where they will make money, and our children will grow up knowing that I can't express my art because it's immoral. But let's, 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 get, let's, let's get this right. What about maybe the issue of what you're talking about, morality? You know how will that be how will that be achieved in society if there is no body to put in place such measures you see now the challenge has been um, we have now become life is dynamic societies are dynamic now we are stuck in a place where I think we are in denial as Africans as Kenyans and immorality or morality is now a very vague and very subjective 
what is moral to you might be different to what is moral from me because you have grown up in a different setting, I have grown up in a different setting, someone who studied in the States would be different, and we cannot be blind to the fact that what is going on. I think it's time now we told our children, this is not what you should not be doing, you are underage, because it's already out there, mm -hmm. and you can't be with your child every day and police them. Now you just have to teach them to identify what is wrong and right, what is appropriate for their age and what is not. Right. Or else, it, I mean, it's going to be, we need to just realize that At morality the same time. is subjective. All right, Lendro, again, you've also been very passionate about a certain bill, you know, by KFSB and uh, Section 3 of 1 that attempts to control uh, online content on advertisements, you know, and um, where there is also, it would allow the introduction of internet service provider liability. I don't know if, uh, w w what is your take right now about it? Um, we are, we are trying to figure out what to do with that, but I think it would be best because uh, what would be the best approach is to treat uh, ISPs, the internet service providers, as a pathway because as um, you know, Safaricom or as all these other platforms, so much content goes through their channels. So they have no control. Yeah. Uh -huh. So the least you can do is what we call, um, there's some safeguards where um, a, an ISP provider would now, the obligation would be to be told that there's something, you know, I don't know, infringement or uh, immoral or whatever on their platform and then they take it down. All but right. to, to, tell, to say that, you know, Safaricom or Telcom or all these other, they are responsible for the content on their platforms, would be very unfair right. and what will that do then access to information then will be curtailed because now they would have to screen every piece of information before you decide to do your research paper then it's also in a closed setting all right now yeah. the last question really and of course uh, we've seen that part of the bill would actually uh, seek to get a photographer liable if they participated on a non-compliant production and I want you to answer this probably having in mind of the hashtag if Ikea was as it We've seen some of the photos that went online and those were the productions of certain, uh, you know, photojournalists and the like. So how exactly would there be a balanced track between developing this sector but ensuring sanity in the same sector? I think it's important for every person who plays a role in a particular setting to be responsible also for what they do. So do not rely on a production company and say, oh, I'm riding on their license, I do whatever they do. You also have a reputation at stake. At the end of the day, what the law says, whoever does the deed is responsible. So then you have to know what parameters in which the law can allow you to sort of um, operate. Mm -hmm. In the example of a photographer, if uh, it's not him who published the photos, and in this situation now in a production house, he's, he's definitely a work for hire. So everything that he creates, he gives, off, uh, he gives over his rights. He only remains with what we call the moral right, photograph by Liz. That's all I remain with. Okay. But everything else is in the production house. How they use it, that's their problem. But now they leave the photographer out of it because he no longer is in control of the work that he's created. So it's important for people to understand their roles and their responsibilities. All right. And... Uh, I bet you all agree that it was quite a very informative piece right there by Liz Elendro. Well, we pressed for time, but remember, such conversations do not end here. We also have our lifestyle segments on www.kbc.co.ke, also available on Instagram at KBC Digital. Kindly do follow up on that to get the latest on entertainment news and the like. You can also get Liz Elendro on her platforms. We thank you so much for keeping us company in this segment. Up next, business. <laughs>